The disk of charge is one of my favorite problems in physics. Suppose you take a set of charges and distribute them uniformly over a disk. If you want to measure the electric field at a point above the center of the disk, you have to add the electric field from each charge. As you do, all of the sideways components will cancel, leaving you with only an electric field perpendicular to the disk. If you carry out the integral, the result has some interesting features. First, if you look at points far away from the disk, you'll get the electric field as a point charge, as you should for any finite charge distribution. But also, if you look at points close to the disk, you get a simple linear function. And if you look at points even closer, you get a uniform function. This is important because because this is exactly how you build a capacitor, which gives off a uniform electric field. Here's the code we're going to use today to look at the electric field of a disk of charge. We have to arrange our sources in a two-dimensional array that mimics a disk. So we are first looping over x, we're going to let x go from 0 to the radius of the disk. And then y is going to be capped off as this function of x. This is the function that gives you a circle, or at least the function that gives you a quarter circle. Um, in order to get the full circle, uh, for each time we go around this loop, we're appending four sources, one at uh, x and y, one at negative x and y, one at x and negative y, and one at negative x and negative y. So that gets us all four quadrants. Um, obviously, the more points we use, the more like a disk this will look. So we're going to start out with uh, 50 points. That's not going to look terribly disk-like. We will increase that uh, in a few minutes to make it look more disk-like. Um, but the rest of the code looks exactly like what we've had before. Um, we are going to uh, have a set of observation points that lie along the z-axis this time. Uh, we set up our observation points here. You might notice that we're um, distributing these a little bit differently. Uh, we're going to be setting up a log-log scale for our uh, electric field. And so we are setting up z in terms of powers of 10. So we're going from 10 to the minus 6 up to 10 to the first power with 100 observation points. So they're going to be spaced uh, logarithmically. Um, down here in our uh, G display, actually I need to change that to a graph to keep up with the updated GlowScript version. Um, here in our graph function, uh, we've got the log x equal to true and log y equal to true so that we can look at different orders of magnitude because remember we're trying to look at extreme values of z, z being much much greater than r and z being much much less than r. So we are going to uh, use the log log scale to get a better view of that. And we're also going to compare the, uh, the, the calculation that we do, the, the results that the computer gives us, with the theoretical results. So for the graph, uh, for the calculation, uh, we're putting in our usual net electric field. We calculate from all of the source charges up here. But then for our theoretical result, we've got the formula that we saw in the intro to the video uh, that involves all this fractioning and square rooting business. And so with this range of observation values, we should be able to see those three uh, regimes of behavior uh, because our R value is equal to one. So we are going from Z being much, much less than R to Z being much, much greater than R. So let's run the code and see what we get. So here's our disk of charge. As promised, it's not entirely disk-like. It looks a little bit more like a stop sign. As we add more points, these edges become more rounded, but basically 50 points is not a good number of points to make a, uh, to make a disk. But let's take a look at the graph that we get. Uh, we have the result of our computation in black, and we have the result of the theory in red. So you can see that for the Theory, um, as you get farther away, you get a power law. You get 1 over z squared, uh, just as predicted. And then as you get closer, as z becomes much, much less than r, you get a uniform function. You get this flat function here. And in our calculation, we do get the power law. So we're getting that, and that works out well. It starts to level out as we get closer, but then it starts shooting up again like this. And when I ran into this uh, last semester, when I was first uh, developing this for my class, I said to myself, okay, I need to add more points, obviously. I mean, look at this thing. This thing is not very disc-like. So I come back over here and let's multiply this by 10. Let's do 500 uh, point charges in our disc. 
There, that's much more disc-like, right? It's still got a little bit of an octagon to it, but these are much finer points. Our results should be a lot better. And our result is a little bit better. We've got a bit better agreement uh, as we get farther away. And it does start to flatten out a bit, but it never quite gets to flat before it starts shooting up again. And you can keep increasing these number of point charges, this number of point charges, the amount of point charges, here, yeah, that's a nice circle. This should be working, right? Well, not exactly. It the, the improvement for the for the increase in the computation you're having to do, and you can see how sluggish the trace is because of the amount of uh, uh, memory it's taking up. You don't get much of an improvement. This thing doesn't really flatten out, and the reason for this is 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 clued in by the fact that this thing behaves like a power log. And in fact, it behaves like another one over r squared. If we go back up here. What you have to do is keep in mind what's going on. We are measuring the electric field at a point above the center of the disk. And we're getting very, very close to the center. That means we're getting very close to the point charge that is right there at the center of the disk. And when we do that, we're still far away from the points on the edges, so they aren't contributing very much. But the one point charge in the center is contributing a lot. And so what you're seeing here is the uncompensated and uncontested electric field of that single point charge in the center. We are getting too close compared to the scale of the, of the, of the mesh in the disk itself. And in fact, one of the reasons, uh, what, one of the ways I figured this out was I printed the ratio of the two spacings, right? So we're taking a look here at, uh, let me find this, where's the thing we print? Now we're taking a look here at the spacing in X over the spacing in Z. And you can see it's not a very large fraction. It's only 2%. So our mesh is only 2% of our step size for the field point. And that is not very big. And so there's no amount of extra point charges that we can add that's going to fix this. What we have to do is change the way we distribute these charges because basically what we're getting from this is that those point charges at the center are contributing too much and the point charges at the end are contributing too little. So this is where I pulled in a trick from my PhD dissertation. So I worked with the numerical renormalization group, which is a fancy way of saying instead of using uniform distribution, you should use a logarithmic distribution. So the numerical renormalization group, or NRG, is used to space out uh, electron energy levels in a conduction band. Here we're going to use the same kind of trick to space out the point charges. So here is where we are creating the list of sources. Only this time, instead of uniformly spacing them out, we're spacing them out in rings. And what we're going to do is make is change the radius of these rings logarithmically or by a by a power law scale. So the radius of each ring is going to be the radius of the disk divided by 2n, where n is the number of the current ring that we're on. So this n goes from 0 to nr, so nr is the number of rings. And then on each rings, we have a number of point charges per Per ring. So that's NPC. So NPC is the number of point charges per ring, and NR is the number of rings. And basically, the area of each of these rings decreases like this. So it's going to be pi r squared times this fraction here. It's going to be 2 uh, to the power negative 2n minus 2 to the power negative 2n plus 2. So that's basically applying the area of a ring with, uh, with this power law uh, radius here. And so in order to distribute the charge, we are distributing the charges across the rings based on their size. So the charge of each of these point charges is given by the total times the area of the ring divided by the area of the entire disk. So this is giving you the amount of, or the fraction of the total charge that needs to be in that ring. And then this is giving you the amount of charge that needs to be in each point charge in the ring. And so this Q is no longer the same for each of our point charges. This Q is now dependent on which ring that charge is housed in. The rest of the code goes the same way. Uh, we don't really have to change anything here. We don't have to change the way we calculate E. We don't have to change the theoretical result. But I wanna show you uh, what this looks like. 
So let's run this and see what we get. So here we've got our rings. As you can see, they each have a decreasing radius. So this one is all the way out to the edge of the disc. This one is half of that. This one is a quarter of the total radius. This one's an eighth, this one's a sixteenth, and down and down we go. You can also see that the size of the point charges decreases. That's to help you visualize the fact that we are giving them each less charge as we go deeper and deeper into the ring so that we end up with still a uniform charge distribution over the rings, just not over the slices that we're making in the, uh, in the point charges themselves. And then if we scroll down, we'll see the result. As you can see, we get a lot better agreement. So we get, we still get the agreement with the one over R squared power law here. We do get a uniform result as you get closer and closer to the disc. For some reason, this the constant value is not the same as this constant value. It's off by about a factor of two. I am still hunting down where that error is. If you find it in this code, please do let me know. I would appreciate uh, knowing what I did wrong here. Um, but I'm going to call this a success because I was able to recover the uh, the uniform result in, uh, of this introductory level problem, and all I had to do was pull in a trick from my PhD dissertation. So uh, it always makes me realize I need to be careful with what I assign my students to do. So thank you so much for watching. I will see you next time. Bye-bye.